based on a true story. A tyrant who persecuted the church. A princess who defied an empire. Her name is Philomena. She suffered it all to preserve her vow of virginity. She was savagely scourged. Cast into a river. God sent his angels to her rescue. The tyrant was enraged. The archers bent their bows. But their arrows refused. The heart of a princess. The strength of a warrior. The glory of a martyr. The destiny of a saint. No danger could threaten her. No fear could shake her, except the fear of losing Christ. Philomena, daughter of light, O oh, faithful virgin and glorious martyr, Pax Tecum Philomena. The following is the account of the life of St. Philomena as taken from the official account of Father Di Lucia's Relazione Historica di Santa Filomena and subsequent annals from locutions received by Sister Luisa di Gesù in August of 1833, revelations that received approval by the Holy Office, presently the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, on December 21st, 1833. I am the daughter of a prince who governed a small state in Greece. My mother is also of royal blood. My parents were without children, but they were idolaters. They continually offered sacrifices and prayers to their false gods. A doctor from Rome named Publius lived in the palace in the service of my father. This doctor professed Christianity, seeing the affliction of my parents. By the impulse of the Holy Spirit, he spoke to them of Christianity and promised to pray for them if they consented to receive baptism. The grace which accompanied his words enlightened their understanding and triumphed over their will. They became Christians and obtained the long-desired happiness that Publius had assured them as the reward of their conversion. At the moment of my birth, they gave me the name of Lumina, an allusion to the light of faith of which I had been, as it were, the fruit. The day of my baptism, they called me Philomena, or Daughter of Light, because on that day I was born to the faith. The affection which my parents bore me was so great that they had me always with them. It was on this account that they took me to Rome on a journey that my father was obliged to make on the occasion of an unjust war with which he was threatened by the haughty Diocletian. I was then 13 years old. On our arrival in the capital of the world, we proceeded to the palace of the emperor, and we were admitted for an audience. 
As soon as Diocletian saw me, his eyes were fixed upon me. He appeared to be prepossessed in this manner during the entire time that my father was stating with animated feelings everything that could serve for his defense. As soon as father had ceased to speak, the emperor desired him to be disturbed no longer, to banish all fear, to think only of living in happiness. These are the emperor's words. I shall place at your disposal all the force of the empire. I ask only one thing, that is the hand of your daughter. My father, dazzled with an honour he was far from expecting, willingly acceded on the spot to the proposal of the emperor. When we returned to our own dwelling, father and mother did all they could to induce me to yield to Diocletian's wishes and to theirs. I cried, Do you wish that for the love of a man I should break the promise I have made to Jesus Christ. My virginity belongs to him. I can no longer dispose of it. But you were young then, too young, answered my father, to have formed such an engagement. He joined the most terrible threats to the command that he gave me to accept the hand of Diocletian. The grace of my God rendered me invincible, and my father, not being able to make the emperor relent, in order to disengage himself from the promise he had given, was obliged by Diocletian to bring me to the imperial chamber. I had to withstand for some time beforehand a new attack from my father's anger. My mother, uniting her efforts to his, endeavoured to conquer my resolution. Caresses, threats, everything was employed to reduce me to compliance. At last, I saw both of my parents fall at my knees and say to me with tears in their eyes, My child, have pity on your father, your mother, your country, our country, our subjects. No, no, I answered them. My virginity which I have vowed to God comes before everything, before you, before my country. My kingdom is heaven. My words plunged them into despair, and they brought me before the emperor, who on his part did all in his power to win me. But his promises, his allurements, his threats, were equally useless. He then flew into a violent fit of anger, and influenced by the devil, had me cast into one of the prisons of the palace, where I was loaded with chains. Thinking that pain and shame would weaken the courage with which my divine spouse inspired me, he came to see me every day. After several days, the emperor issued an order for my chains to be loosed, that I might take a small portion of bread and water. He renewed his attacks, some of which would have been fatal to purity had it not been for the grace of God. The defeats which he always experienced were for me the preludes to new tortures. Can take so much until I pass enough. <laughs> but I'm only human, and I bleed when I fall down. I'm only human, and I crash and I break down. What's my Prayer supported me. I did not cease to recommend myself to Jesus and his most pure mother. My captivity had lasted 37 days when, in the midst of the heavenly light, I saw Mary holding her divine son in her arms. My daughter, she said to me, three days more of prison and after 40 days you shall leave this state of pain. Such happy news renewed my courage to prepare for the frightful combat awaiting. The Queen of Heaven reminded me of the name I had received in baptism, saying, You are Lumina, as your spouse is called Light or Sun. Fear not, I will aid you. Now, nature, whose weakness asserts itself, is humbling you. 
In the moment of struggle, grace will come to you to lend its force. The angel who is mine also, Gabriel, whose name expresses force, will come to your succor. I will recommend you especially to his care. The vision disappeared, leaving my prison scented with a fragrance like incense. I experienced joy out of this world, something indefinable. What the Queen of Angels had prepared for me was soon experienced. Diocletian, despairing of bending me, decided upon public chastisement to offend my virtue. He condemned me to be stripped and scourged like the spouse I preferred to him. These were his horrifying words. Since she is not ashamed to prefer to an emperor like me, a malefactor condemned to an infamous death by his own people, she deserves that my justice shall treat her as he was treated. The prison guards hesitated to unclothe me entirely, but they did tie me to a column in the presence of the great men of the court. They lashed me with violence until I was bathed in blood. My whole body felt like one open wound, but I did not faint. The tyrant had me dragged back to the dungeon expecting me to die. I hoped to join my heavenly spouse. Two angels shining with light appeared to me in the darkness. They poured a soothing balm on my wounds, bestowing on me a vigor I did not have before the torture. When the emperor was informed of the change that had come over me, he had me brought before him. He viewed me with a greedy desire and tried to persuade me that I owed my healing and regained vigor to Jupiter, another god whom he, the emperor, had sent to me. He attempted to impress me with his belief that Jupiter desired me to be empress of Rome, joining to these seductive words, promises of great honor, including the most flattering words. Diocletian tried to caress me. <laughs> Fiendishly, he attempted to complete the work of hell which he had begun. The divine spirit, to whom I am indebted for constancy in preserving my purity, seemed to fill me with light and knowledge. To all the proofs which I gave of the solidity of our faith, neither Diocletian nor his own courtiers could find an answer. Then the frenzied emperor dashed at me, commanding a guard to chain an anchor around my neck and bury me deep in the waters of the Tiber. The order was executed. You were the shadow to my light, did you feel us? Another star. Fade away when your aim is out of sight. Wanna see a light? Where are you now? Was it all in the fantasy? Where are you now? Were you only imaginary? Where are you now? Atlantis under the sea. I was cast into the water, but God sent to me two angels who unfastened the anchor. It fell into the river mud where it remains, no doubt, to the present time. This shallow water's never met what I needed. I'm letting go a deeper dive, eternal silence of the sea. I'm breathing. Alive, where are you now? Was it all in my fantasy? Where are you now? Where are you?
The angels transported me gently, in full view of the multitude upon the riverbank. I came back unharmed, not even wet, after being plunged with the heavy anchor. When a cry of joy rose from the watchers on the shore, and so many embraced Christianity by proclaiming their belief in my God, Diocletian attributed my preservation to secret magic. Then the emperor had me dragged through the streets of Rome and shot with a shower of arrows. My blood flowed, but I did not faint. Diocletian thought that I was dying and commanded the guards to carry me back to the dungeon. Heaven honoured me with a new favour there. I fell into a sweet sleep. A second time, the tyrant attempted to have me pierced with sharper darts. Again the archers bent their bows. They gathered all their strength, but the arrows refused to second their intentions. The emperor was present. In a rage, he called me a magician and, thinking that the action of fire could destroy the enchantment, he ordered the darts to be made red in a furnace and directed against my heart. He was obeyed. But these darts, after having gone over a part of the space which they were to cross to come to me, took quite a contrary direction and returned to strike those by whom they had been hurled. Six of the archers were killed by them. Several among them renounced paganism. The people began to render public testimony to the power of God that protected me. These murmurs and the acclamations infuriated the tyrant. He determined to hasten my death by piercing my neck with a lance. My soul took flight towards my heavenly spouse who placed me with the crown of virginity and the palm of martyrdom in a distinguished place among the elect. The day that was so happy for me and saw me enter into glory was Friday, the third hour after midday, the same hour that saw my divine master expire. August the 10th was the day of my rest, my triumph, my birth into heaven, my entering into the possession of such eternal goods as the human mind cannot possibly imagine. 